Hey everyone, Neavolo here, and in today's video, we're going to be going over the entire illustrious and super enthralling Swordsmith Village arc of Demon Slayer. This arc takes place within the hidden Swordsmith Village and gives us some of the most amazing context as to the inner workings of the Demon Slayer world. I really enjoyed making this video and its counterpart, the entire entertainment district of Demon Slayer, so if you haven't seen that yet and want some context as to what happens exactly before we arrive at this point in the story, then make sure you go and check that video out so you understand what exactly is going on and don't miss out on any vital information. Also, if you lovely people want to get early access to all of these kind of videos in the future, along with some super special extras, then make sure you go and check out my Patreon, which I'll leave down in the description below. As honestly, that helps me more than you can imagine and lets me know that I can spend more time on these kind of videos to make them even better for all of you. Obviously, you guys don't have to do that though, as I'll still make them either way, because honestly, I just love doing this. So if you still are eager for these kind of videos just in general, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well, and also be sure to leave a like on the video, as it helps out with that silly old YouTube algorithm. But anyway, enough of that. Sit back, relax, grab a bag of popcorn, as this is going to be an absolute banger, where you are constantly left wondering what could possibly happen next. Goto, a male member of the Kakushi, who are the cleanup brigade of the Demon Slayers, is seen walking down the halls of the Butterfly Mansion. While he walks through the halls, he reveals that two months have passed since the end of the battle at the Entertainment District. Kakushi remembers how badly injured everyone was, especially Tanjiro. Hoping that the smell of his castella will wake the comatose Tanjiro, he is left completely stunned and infuriated when he walks in to discover a shattered vase on the floor. Noticing Kano, he announces the food that he brought and asks her to clear a free spot for it. Tanjiro then wearily thanks Goto for the dessert, leaving him completely stunned. So much that he drops his entire dish. He then angrily bursts out at Kano for not saying that Tanjiro had regained his consciousness and comically abuses her for her silence before running into the hall to summon everyone. Keo, Sumi, and Nahu shed tears of joy after discovering that he is awakened, but are then immediately frightened when Aoi comes flying into the room. After untangling herself, she begins to sob at his bedside, and Tanjiro finds out that Zenitsu had woken up the day after the battle and had just left, screaming and crying before going on a job. Tengen, the sound Hashira, left after the battle, being carried away by his wives despite his terrible injuries. When Tanjiro goes to ask about Inosuke, he is told by Aoi that he has been horribly poisoned and that Inosuke was on the verge of death. While she's explaining, Tanjiro begins to wonder if he was hallucinating or not as he spots Inosuke hanging on the ceiling. Everyone in the room then looks up in horror to witness Inosuke crawling upside down on the ceiling. He loudly praises Tan Pachiro for noticing him on the ceiling. Inosuke drops down onto Tanjiro's bed, then brags that he woke up a week before him and how he had poison resistance, making him, in his eyes, immortal. Inosuke gloats about having an apparent immortality and is swiftly corrected by Goto that he is just simply a moron. Because of this, a fight ensues between the two and Aoi rushes to break it up. As the bickering gets louder, Kanui tries to quiet the room down until she has to tell the other two to be quiet as Tanjiro has actually fallen back asleep. Inosuke immediately worries that Tanjiro has returned into his comatose state, but the others assure him that he just needs to get more rest. A week goes by with Tanjiro making a full recovery and Inosuke embarking on a new mission. While Tanjiro works on improving his weakened state, he asks Kyo and Naho about his new sword. But to his complete dismay, they show him the angry scratched drawings of hate, which clearly depict that the swordsmith would not make Tanjiro another sword. Now distraught, Kyo tries to uplift Tanjiro by saying that Hotaru is being the difficult one and he should try to meet with him at the swordsmith village to discuss it in person. Tanjiro ends up asking for permission to visit the village in which Kagaya allows him to go. He sends a new Kakushi to take him. She informs him that in order to keep the village safety hidden, Tanjiro must be carried there and will have to put on a blindfold, plug in earplugs and especially plug his nose. Throughout the journey, Tanjiro is frequently passed on to new Kakushi, while the crows are also swapped in an effort to maintain the location's secrecy. Once Tanjiro arrives at the village, he is amazed by the sense of the hot springs. He loudly shares his gratitude towards the Kakushi for transporting him, which echoes loudly through the hot springs. His voice is eventually heard by the love Hashira, Mitsuri Kanroji, who is bathing in a nearby spring. 
Once at the swordsmith village, Tanjiro is greeted by the village's chief, Tetsun Tetsun Kawahara, who dubs himself the best of his craft in the village. Tetsun discloses to Tanjiro that the village is currently looking for Hotaru Haganezuka after he disappeared a few days prior. Tanjiro comments on his swordsmith's cute name, which Tetsun reveals that he himself gave him that name. The chief notes about how Hotaru had always had a bad temper, and when Tanjiro attempts to apologize for fueling this temper through breaking his swords, Tetsun refutes it by stressing that Hotaru should be creating swords that wouldn't break. He reassures Tanjiro that they will bring Hotaru back or alternatively have a different swordsmith forge him a new blade. Tetsun then suggests that Tanjiro relax in the hot springs. While advancing to the hot springs, Tanjiro runs into Mitsuri Kanroji, who had just returned from that said hot spring. Kenroji complains about how she was ignored when she was asked for an individual's name at the spring. Tanjiro calms her by revealing that the villagers were almost done with the dinner for their guests, which Mitsuri excitedly hurries off to. At the springs, Tanjiro is suddenly hit with a tooth and is surprised to encounter Genya Shinazugawa. He excitedly jumps in the water and tries to converse with his fellow demon slayer, but is saddened after Genya angrily strikes him and storms off. Back at the village, Tanjiro praises Mitsuri for the amount she is capable of eating, declaring that he himself would also try to eat lots and grow strong. He then brings up Genya, with Mitsuri sadly observing how the boy must be Tsunami Shinazugawa's younger brother, given that they share the last name, despite the Winhashira telling her that he didn't even have one. Tanjiro asks why she felt it was pitiful, and while playing with Nezuko, Mitsuri replies that she herself had five younger siblings and had a good relationship with all of them. The two chat and both hope to someday be able to have a nice conversation with Genya, and Tanjiro decides to bring him his leftovers since he didn't come to dinner. As they walk through the corridor with Nezuko, Tanjiro inquires Mitsuri on the reason why she joined the Demon Slayer Corps. Embarrassed, she states that she wanted to find a man to marry, someone who was stronger than her and could protect her. As she goes on about her thoughts, Tanjiro listens in disbelief. The trio are then approached by Kakushi, who informs Mitsuri that her new sword will be ready soon and that she should check it out so that it could be adjusted if necessary. The Hashira bids farewell to Tanjiro and praises him for his hard work, expressing her approval for the siblings. After Tanjiro declares that he will be sure to defeat Muzan, Mitsuri happily hints about a secret weapon hidden in the village that could make him even stronger. The next day, Tanjiro searches through the forest looking for Hotaru and ponders about the secret weapon Mitsuri told him about. In the distance, he suddenly hears two individuals, one of them being the Mr. Hashira, Muchiro Tokito. Behind the trees in the forest, Tanjiro worriedly watches as a young child yells at the Mr. Hashira, proclaiming that he wouldn't hand over his key and his knowledge to him. Muchiro suddenly strikes and grips the boy, much to Tanjiro's horror, as he races over to restrain Muchiro's wrists in an attempt to force him to let go. Despite having a smaller and thinner body composition than Tanjiro, Mushiro does not budge and asks for Tanjiro to release his hold, quickly punching him in the stomach and calling him weak when he does not do so. The Hashira then senses a demon in Tanjiro's box, but he slaps his hand away and saves the boy in the process. When the boy continues denying Muchiro the key, he insults him and the other swordsmiths, stating they had no worth besides making swords and this conversation was currently wasting him time that could be used to save people. Angry at Muchiro's degrading words, Tanjiro hits him and expresses how he was too cruel to the child. While he states that he does not deny the accuracy of his words, Tanjiro stresses the importance of the swordsmiths and how they too are fighting along with the demon slayers, albeit not on the front lines. Michiro cuts him off and hits him in the neck, knocking him out cold. Right before losing consciousness, Tanjiro notices Hotaru hiding behind a tree. While unconscious, Tanjiro hears a conversation between the child and Hotaru, but the latter runs off as soon as Tanjiro begins to regain his consciousness. After picking himself up, Tanjiro excitedly inquires whether Hotaru was just there, which the boy nervously denies. The boy also reveals that he gave the key to Muchiro, which Tanjiro apologizes for intervening as it wasn't his place to. He's thanked, however, for standing up to the Hashira in order to defend a complete stranger. The two converse and the boy informs Tanjiro about the key's use, which is to operate a deteriorating mechanical doll that had been built by his ancestors and was used for swordsmen to train with. 
In the middle of their conversation, the two suddenly hear loud sounds. The boy leads Tanjiro over to where Muchiro is intensely training with the battle doll, dubbed Yoroichi Type Zero. While watching Tokito train against the doll, Tanjiro looks at the doll's face and ponders the idea that he has seen it before. Confused as to its appearance, Tanjiro asks why it has six arms, in which he is told that it was modelled after a real swordsman. The doll's six arms were necessary to imitate the swordsman's unrealistic movements. Tanjiro tries to push for more information, but the boy apologises and states he didn't know much else, besides that it originated in the Sengoku period. Surprised, Tanjiro notes how that must mean that the Yoroichi Type-0 is over 300 years old, and even so, it still hadn't been destroyed. The boy replies that his ancestors were able to construct the doll at a level that couldn't be accomplished again at the present time, hence its durability, and that he wouldn't be able to fix it himself, especially without the aid of his late father, given that he himself doesn't possess the knowledge or skills to do so. Because of this, Tanjiro realises the reasoning behind his resolve to not hand over the key to someone who could potentially destroy the doll. While they continue to observe Muchiro for a while longer, Tanjiro admires the Hashira's extraordinary degree of skill, despite being of a similar age. Machiro's crow chips in and refers to him as a descendant of the sun-breathing users and a genius leagues different from Tanjiro. Surprised by his bloodline heritage, he curiously asks why Muchiro wasn't able to use sun breathing, which receives him an angry assault by the crow. While being attacked by the crow, Tanjiro suddenly remembers the dream he had and how the swordsman he saw had a face that matched that of the dolls. Hearing his words, the crow stops and grumpily questions the logic behind his words, given how the swordsman was from so long ago. The young boy pitches in, proposing that perhaps it was a memory that was passed on, providing the example of a swordsmith inheriting memories from their swords and skills from their ancestors, suggesting it may be similar to what Tanjiro was experiencing. The crow thinks of this idea as nonsense, but cuts it off as Tanjiro introduces himself to the boy, and the boy introduces himself as Kotetsu. Suddenly, the group hears a sound and witnesses Muchiro destroying parts of the doll, with pieces of the armor flying away. Devastated at the sight, Kotetsu runs away and hides in a tree, crying over the broken doll. Tanjiro finds him and attempts to motivate him by saying he'll eventually be able to improve and fix it, in which Kotetsu replies that he is too pathetic to do so. But hearing this, Tanjiro climbs up the tree and flicks Kotetsu as a method of snapping him back into reality, exclaiming how he had to make the effort and develop the skills so that even if he wasn't able to fix the Yoroichi Type-0, the generations after him would be able to do so. Tanjiro compares his struggle with Kotetsu's, affirming that even if he dies before he is able to accomplish his goals, someone else will eventually be able to do so in his place, as long as the framework is set which is similar to what was said during Tanjiro's dream flashback by the mysterious man. Cheered up, Kotetsu and Tanjiro conclude to determinedly work hard together. While they chat during a walk through the forest, they encounter Muchiro again, who expresses that the training was helpful. However, his sword broke, so he will be taking one of the doll's swords. He tosses the broken sword indifferently to Tanjiro, asking him to discard of it. At first, confused by the swordsman's attitude, Tanjiro realises he lacked a malicious intent and likely wasn't acting rudely on purpose. Tanjiro rushes to Kotetsu, who appears saddened while staring at the broken doll in the rain. Tanjiro suggests they check if it can still move, which is met by approval from the boy. As they pick it up, it remains stagnant for a few moments before suddenly shifting into a stance. Randomly, Kotetsu then fiercely orders Tanjiro to train with the doll and become stronger than Muchiro with his aid. Tanjiro begins to train with the Yoroichi Type-0, while Kotetsu uses his analytical skills and newfound motivation to excessively critique the Demon Slayer's movements. He states that until Tanjiro can accomplish what he wants, he will not receive any food. Kotetsu shows Tanjiro another method of adjusting the doll's movements through twisting its fingers such that it'd coordinate with the user's weaknesses and compares the actions to that of playing with a wooden puzzle box. After readjusting the doll, Tanjiro continues brutally training with it, still without food, water or sleep under Kotetsu's direction. Just as Tanjiro approaches the brink of death, comparable to nearly crossing the Sanzu River which is similar to the Greek concept of the Styx but in Japanese mythology, because of this almost death moment, he becomes capable of smelling the incoming movement of the 
doll and lands a hit on it, earning him his first meal in a few days. After gaining this ability to predict movements, Tanjiro continues to train with the doll and improves his stamina and foresight. In the middle of a spa with the doll, Tanjiro's newly improved abilities grant him an opening to behead it. However, he hesitates mid-swing and worries about breaking the doll, but Kotetsu yells at him to strike, reassuring him that he would be able to fix it. Internally, the young boy begs Tanjiro to not waver so that one day, he will become stronger than anyone else. With Kotetsu's approval obtained, Tanjiro succeeds in landing a blow to the doll's neck and breaks his sword in the process. He apologizes to Kotetsu for the ruined sword, but after Kotetsu's sudden exclamation, Tanjiro turns to see a hidden sword's hilt emerging from the doll's body where the head used to be. The sword's hilt, appearing out of the doll, startles Tanjiro and Kotetsu, who shout in shock. Their surprise quickly shifts to fascination and excitement as the pair attempts to deduce the age of the blade. Kotetsu urges Tanjiro to take the sword, but Tanjiro is adamant on the fact that he could not and the doll breaking to make it appear wasn't completely his doing. Kotetsu insists as the owner of the doll that he has the final say and that Tanjiro should take it, especially considering how he needed a new blade anyways. Caving in, Tanjiro pulls out the blade as Kotetsu watches excitedly in anticipation, but they are disheartened after seeing that the blade had rusted with its age. Kotetsu tries to apologize to a tearful Tanjiro for getting his hopes up, but they are suddenly interrupted by a muscular Hotaru Haganezuka emerging from their woods. Hotaru mentions that he heard their conversation and tries to take the sword from Tanjiro and Kotetsu. They try to get Hotaru to explain why he is acting this way, but the swordsmith continues to try and take the sword and finally forces it out of their hands. Kozo Kanamori appears behind Hotaru and tickles his sides, making him fall limp. Kozo greets Tanjiro and Kotetsu and goes on to explain Hotaru's situation. He states that Hotaru had been remotely training in order to improve his forging skills so that he could make a strong sword for Tanjiro that would not chip or break, in which Tanjiro happily admires Hotaru's thoughtfulness. Kozo continues on saying how Tanjiro's repeated requests for swords from Hotaru made him happy, as he lost many of his clients with his personality. While they chat, Hotaru suddenly regains consciousness and confidently declares that he will fix the rusted blade, while Kotetsu fusses over how he could have easily just explained that before they fought over the sword. The next day, Tanjiro talks about Hotaru's progress on the sword with Genya, who is angered by Tanjiro's presence and attempts at friendliness, so he tries to get him to leave. When he starts yelling, Tanjiro notices that the tooth he had pulled out a few days ago had reappeared. He questions him on this and shows the tooth that he had picked up as proof disgusting Genya and resulting in him being kicked out of the room. Saddened, Tanjiro ponders his fellow Demon Slayer's consistent anger. Somewhere else, as the calm night continued, a lone swordsmith strolls through the village after a bath and encounters a pot mysteriously placed on the ground. Curiously, he reaches for it, but is suddenly engulfed by the pot, killing him. Gyoko, the upper rank 5, emerges and comments on the disgusting quality of the swordsmiths as meals. Elsewhere, upper rank 4 Hantengu cowers on a roof and cowardly states that they must quickly accomplish their mission. An asleep Tanjiro is woken by Tokito pinching his nose. The Mr. Shira questions Tanjiro if he knew Kozo Kanamori's whereabouts as he was his new swordsmith. Tanjiro mentions that he was likely with Hotaru and offers to help find them. Machiro asks why Tanjiro would willingly accompany him when he had many other things to be doing, and Tanjiro replies that he believed helping others would positively benefit him. At Tanjiro's words, Tokito feels a strong sense of familiarity and questions him on what he just said. The Demon Slayer tries to reply, but is hit by an awakened Nezuko, breaking Machiro's perception. Seeing Nezuko, Machiro comments on her uniqueness and wonders where he had seen her before, while Tanjiro worries about the Chachamaru, Tamiyo's feline assistant, that had appeared before them. The trio keep thinking about their respective worries, when suddenly Tanjiro and Muchiro sense a presence behind the door. When they glance over, Hantengu crawls into the room without radiating his presence as a demon. Surprised, Tanjiro and Muchiro both realize Hantengu is an upper rank demon and prepare to attack, with Muchiro immediately using mist breathing fourth form shifting flow slash, but Hantengu swiftly dodges to the ceiling and cries, begging the demon slayers not to hurt him. 
Tanjiro tells himself not to hesitate and uses Hotaru's newly forged blade to attack Hentengu with Hinokami Kagura Sunflower Thrust. Hintengu dodges again, but receives a blow from Nezuko, who's in her awakened form. Realizing this, Tanjiro tells Nezuko to not transform fully, while at the exact same time, Muchiro successfully beheads Hintengu. Tanjiro remembers that beheading an upper rank does not necessarily result in its death based on his prior fight with Daki and Gyutaro, and tells Muchiro to keep his focus. Right as he does, the severed head and the body transform into two new demons, one of which holds a leaf-shaped fan. Muchiro attacks the demon with the fan while Tanjiro takes on the other. As Muchiro rushes to attack, the demon waves his fan at him and intensely blasts Muchiro out of the building. Tanjiro and Nezuko manage to hold on to the rubble and come face to face with the two demons. Karaku asks his partner, Sakido, if he was having fun in which Sekido responds negatively and uses his staff to emit bolts of lightning-like attacks which slowly make Tanjiro lose consciousness. But just before he does, he sees Genya on the rooftop pointing a gun directly at Sekido. Genya shoots both Sekido and Karaku with his Nichiren gun, blasting off Sekido's head and nearly decapitating Karaku. Karaku expresses his enjoyment towards the fight as Genya rushes in to slash off his head with a Nichiren sword. But as he does this, Tanjiro yells at Genya that his attacks were futile and the demons were willingly being beheaded so they could keep splitting and increase their attack power. Tanjiro begins to desperately analyze his opponents and tries to pinpoint their weaknesses, but his thoughts are interrupted by a third bird-like demon a rogi who lifts him up into the air with his foot. Realizing that each demon has a unique ability, Tanjiro instructs Nezuko to insist Genya. However, horrified, he realizes that Genya had been impaled by a fourth demon, a Zetsu. Orogi taunts him for worrying about the others and not himself, proceeding to generate a sonic scream. Tanjiro attempts to counter with Hinokami Kagura and successfully cuts off Orogi's leg, but is unable to dodge his scream and is violently struck with the attack as he falls. He plummets through trees and lands on the ground. He pleads with himself to get up and protect the village, but his injuries render him incapable of easily moving. Aizetsu lands near him and holds his leg down as he directs another shriek in Tanjiro's direction. Elsewhere, Michiro dashes through the forest as he makes his way back to the village. He spots Kotetsu trying to hold off a minion fish demon and internally decides that he is not a priority to save. But as he hears the cries of Kotetsu while the demon grabs him, Muchiro remembers Tanjiro's words of how helping others would positively benefit him. He slashes the fish demon's arm, releasing Kotetsu, and stands over the boy while requesting for him to run so that he would not be in the way. Machiro slashes the fish demon and decapitates it, but it regenerates. He tries breaking the pot stationed on the demon's back and subsequently makes it disintegrate. The Hashira then realizes that the pot was the source of the power for the demon, likely the result of a blood demon art. As he continues to think, a crying Kotetsu ambushes him with a hug and thanks him for saving him. The Hashira tells Kotetsu to leave as he has to make it back to the village. Kotetsu begs him to not go since Kozo and Hotaru were under attack while Hotaru was finishing a blade. Muchiro tries to turn down his request but he hesitates when he hears Kagaya Yubashiki's voice in his head, who tells him to rediscover himself. Surprised at the pause, Machiro thinks back to when he had gotten amnesia after being saved by Kagaya, who had told him not to worry about the memory lost and that the mist in his head will eventually clear out, with matters that seem unimportant at first. Convinced, Machiro carries Kotetsu with him as they search for Kozo. As they continue through the forest, Machiro begins to doubt if he was doing the right thing as the village was still in danger. However, he pushes the thought away and reminds himself that he is the Mr. Shira acknowledged by his master. In the forest near the edge of the village, Tanjiro dodges an attack from a rogi by slicing his head, splitting him into two more demons. The pair of demons generate more sonic screams and direct them at Tanjiro, but the demon slayer is able to withstand them and observes that Hantengu is most powerful at four separate demons that represent the four primary emotions. Any more splitting would decrease their attack strength. With this information, Tanjiro continues to attack Orogi and is slashed across the chest with the demon's sharp claws, but manages to land multiple blows on his head. Back in the building, Nezuko struggles against Karaku. Sakido impatiently asks for his partner to defeat her, and Izetsu volunteers to land the final blow. 
However, as Aizetsu attempts to pull his spear out of Genya, the Demon Slayer points his gun at him and blasts off his head. Sakeru berates Aizetsu for his foolishness after Genya shoots off his head, and the demon responds by forcibly pulling the spear out of Genya, mortally damaging him. He comments on how the spear lodged in Genya's body had prevented him from dying after it hit his vital points, and now he will perish. Ignoring him, Genya quietly chants the Amida Sutra, which is recognized by Aizetsu. Angered at the delay, Sakito yells at Aizetsu to kill Genya, but the Demon Slayer dodges his spear and attacks Aizetsu from behind with a Nichiren sword. However, before Genya can cut the demon's head, he gets blasted from Sakito's lightning and becomes incapacitated though he manages to hit Sakito with a bullet. Aizetsu responds by hitting him with the spear's shaft, knocking him into the wall. Still struggling against Nezuko, Karaku gleefully watches his companions fight and then impales Nezuko through the stomach with his foot. He gives instructions to Sakito and pulls Nezuko's arm off, but he receives a hefty kick from her and nearly loses his head. Using blood demon art, Nezuko proceeds to burn Karaku and pulls herself from his grasp. When Karaku is yelled at by Sakido, she takes his fan and blows him out of the building. She tries to do the same thing with Sakido, but he sticks his staff through her neck and shocks her with bolts of lightning, paralyzing her. Back in the forest, Tanjiro continues fighting against Hirogi, who continuously slashes him with his talons. Tanjiro forces himself not to panic and makes it a priority to return to the building, internally telling Genya and Nezuko to keep holding on. Genya recovers from being hit into the wall and continues muttering the chant. Surprised that he is still alive, Sakito questions him. Smiling, Genya holds up his gun and tells him his name, stating that he will be the one to kill him. While Tanjiro continues his fight against Arogi, he considers using the demon's flight ability to escape the forest and return to Nezuko and Genya. After finalizing his plan, Tanjiro stabs the demon in the mouth after being picked up and uses the force to smash into the building's exterior wall, completely destroying it. Tanjiro picks himself up in time to see Sakado paralyzing Nezuko. When he dashes to save her, Sakado generates another staff and tries to hit Tanjiro. But the boy uses Arogi's foot to defend himself and prevent the lightning from reaching him. He then slices the demon's head and tongue, stalling for some time to pull the staff out of Nezuko's neck. Suddenly, Tanjiro gets slammed down on the ground with the second staff and is about to receive a shock of lightning, but Nezuko recovers in time to burn Sakado and prevent him from hurting him. Relieved that Nezuko's blood demon art is effective, he looks up to see Karaku soar through the air and hit the building's floor with enough pressure to bore a hole through it and render Tanjiro and Nezuko unconscious. The demons then regroup and gaze over their opponent, planning on dealing the final blow. In the depths of the forest, Tokito defends the fish demon and saves Kozo. After a reunion, Muchiro requests for Kozo to provide him with his fixed blade to replace the chipped one he is currently using. Kozo agrees that Muchiro needs a new blade and mentions that it was Tanjiro who asked him to fix the old one. He leads the Mistashira and Kotetsu to the shed where Haganezuka is currently working. Kozo explains that he has a sword for Michiro in the shed, and after he receives it, he should immediately head back to the village to protect the chief. Michiro denies this proposal and pulls Kozo back when he tries to advance towards the shed. He tells him he senses something and instantly sees a pot rattle in front of him. Emerging from the pot, Gyoko, the upper rank 5, comes out and identifies Tokito Michiro as a Hashira for realizing that he was there. Gyoko introduces himself to Tokito, Kanemori, and Kitetsu and asks for a brief moment before he kills them. He calmly presents his art piece titled Death Throws of the Smiths, which consisted of multiple mangled smiths and blades pierced through their bodies. The demon starts describing his detailed work while the horrified Kozo and Kotetsu name the swordsmiths. Gyoko taunts them by their reactions and twists one of the swords, resulting in one of the swordsmiths screaming out in pain. Aggravated by his demonstration, Machira attacks Gyoko, but he retreats into his pot before the Hashira can cut him. He reappears in another pot on the shed's roof, and Machira notes his ability to switch between the pots, then slices up the one on the roof. Gyoko swiftly switches to yet another pot, appearing out of thin air on the ground, and expresses the great irritation at Machira for destroying his artwork. The demon 
summons a couple of fish demons, which surprise Michiro with blood demon art, thousand needle, fish kill, and Kyoko showers hundreds of sharp needles at him. The swordsman manages to dodge the first onslaught of needles, but is forced to take multiple hits from the second attack of needles to protect Kozo and Kotetsu. He tells the civilians to get away as the fish continue to attack him. Gyoko stands on the side and laughs at Muchiro's appearance which consists of multiple needles sticking out of him. He reveals that the needles contain poison and chides him for having to die because he saved insignificant people. Gyoko's words spark an intense sense of familiarity to Muchiro as he tries to remember where he had heard them before, suddenly recalling a hot summer day in a small abode. The demon expresses his eagerness to create a nice sculpture with Ashira, but is interrupted by Muchiro attacking him. Gyoko uses blood demon art water prison pot to surround his opponent with a pot shaped prison of water, rendering him unable to breathe or attack as his blade could not pierce through the layer of water. He laughs at his predicament and proclaims claims that the 12 Kazuki desire to weaken the demon slayers and reach Kagaya Yubashiki. Nearby, a crow calls through the night as Mitsuri Kanroji runs through the forest. She tells herself to hurry and enthusiastically states the convenience of the swordsmith village being close to where she was stationed. In the village, a group of swordsmiths try to defend themselves as a fish demon approaches them. Mitsuri Kanroji arrives and slashes the demon, killing it. She apologizes for her late arrival and heads towards the chief's residence. At Tenshin's location, a swordsmith tries to save him from being crushed by a fish demon, but his injuries render him unable to move. Mitsuri appears right before him and instructs him to stay still to prevent his injuries from becoming worse. The Love Ashira then attacks with love breathing, first form, shivers of first love, slicing the demon and making it release the chief. After defeating it, Mitsuri angrily mutters how those who hurt others will never make her heart throb. As Tetsuin falls from the demon's grasp, she manages to catch him before he hits the ground. Crying, she begs him to wake up, and after a few coughs, he comments on how he was caught by someone so cute. Relieved to see that he was alright, Mitsuri quickly goes to help the others that were wounded. Elsewhere, Tanjiro suddenly awakes to hear the voices of Hantengo's various forms. He looks to see Nezuko carrying him through the building as she dodges bolts of lightning, and Tanjiro remembers that they were previously knocked unconscious. They get hit with a shock of lightning, and Tanjiro manages to defend Nezuko and himself from Urogi's swoop, running out of the room. Sekiro yells at Karaku for being too slow and tells him to use his Uchiwa fan to destroy the building, to which he agrees. The pressure from Karaku's fan attack makes the building collapse with Nezuko caught inside the mess. She grasps onto Tanjiro's blade, making herself bleed while Tanjiro begs for her to let go, and says he will find a way to move the rubble. But she refuses to stop holding the blade and uses her blood demon art to set it on fire. Tanjiro notices the blade burning from the heat and is shocked to see it change colour from black to red as it gets enveloped in flames. All of a sudden, through an inherited memory, Tanjiro sees an unnamed man and woman comment on how a swordsman with earrings had a blade that was normally jet black but somehow turned red when he was in combat. Tanjiro links the swordsman's blade with his own, noticing the similarities in their colour changes and how his was thanks to Nezuko's blood demon art. He pushes himself to ignore his body's fatigue and injuries and tells himself to meet the expectations of those who have helped him so far. The three demons belittle Tanjiro and rush towards him to attack, but they see the red sword and Muzan Kibijutsu's memories trigger. The forms recognise the red sword as one used by the demon slayer that nearly killed their master, and as Tanjiro swings his sword back, his motions greatly resemble those of the swordsman. Stunned, the three forms are all then slashed with the Hinokami Kagura Dragon Sun Halo Head Dance. After decapitating them, Tanjiro recognises the fiery sensation when cutting down the three demons as the same one he felt when he dealt the final blow to Guataro at the Entertainment District. He goes to look for Hantengu's last form, Aizetsu, and sees him impaled to a tree with his own spear as Genya Shinazugawa stands in front of him, holding the demon's head. Tanjiro's relief over Genya's safety and the defeat of Aizetsu quickly switches to horror as Genya turns to reveal the demon-fired face. His thoughts are interrupted by a yelling Karaku, who complains about his inability to regenerate and the burning sensation in his wounds. Tanjiro feels uncertain if defeating the four emotion demons is the correct way to finish the upper rank four, and at that moment, he smells a fifth body. He tries to think of how to find it, but Genya grabs him, declaring that he will be the one to defeat the upper rank four and become a Hashira, not Tanjiro. 
Realizing that Genya has not succumbed to the demon instincts, Tanjiro and Nezuko give him full support of his goals, much to Genya's surprise. Their conversation abruptly ends when Sakado blasts lightning towards them. Tanjiro splits up with Genya and Nezuko to run off and find the fifth body so Genya can be the one to behead him. He rushes around and desperately searches, finally spotting the body cowering and quivering behind a bush. He hears it muttering encouragement to himself, saying the emotion demons would defeat the slayers. Tanjiro gives directions to Genya about where to find the fifth form of Hantengu and asks Nezuko to provide him assistance. He then is nearly swept away by Karaku's wind attack. Nezuko attempts to slash Sakado before he can release lightning on her brother, but she gets impaled by Izetsu's spear. Tanjiro hinders Sakado's movements by cutting off his hand holding the staff and the demon notes Tanjiro's exceptional battle adaption skills. Orogi is slashed by the flaming blade, and Nezuko grabs Aizetsu, enveloping him in fire and burning him. Kuroku counters Tanjiro by slamming his fan and forcing Tanjiro to the ground with pressure. However, before he can again attack, his arm falls off and he curses Tanjiro for cutting it. Genya receives more directions from Tanjiro as the latter yells them out, and he desperately keeps searching for the fifth body. After more continuous searching, Genya spots Hantengu behind the bushes, shrunk down. He shoots him with his gun, but the demon dodges and runs away. While pursuing him, Genya inwardly chastises the demon's wimpy nature and swings at his neck with his Nichiren sword. He pushes himself to force the blade through Hantengu's neck, but the sword suddenly snaps due to the demon's thick neck. He tries shooting again with his gun to no avail. All of a sudden, Sakato appears behind Genya and aims his staff at his neck. Distressed, Genya remarks that he cannot regenerate his head and is about to die. But before he gets struck, he thinks of his elder brother, Sanimi, and how he wanted to become a Hashira so he could apologize to him for something that had happened between them. Genya thinks back to his past, where his small and weak mother would often be abused by his father alongside himself and his siblings. One night, Genya notices that she was late coming back, even after their older brother Sanimi went to look for her. He calms his siblings and tells them to sleep, but they suddenly hear a knock on the door. Genya tries to tell them not to open it in case it was a stranger, but they ignore his warning and are immediately slashed upon reaching it. Genya is also cut across the cheek and he states in horror at a figure grasping onto the ceiling within the darkness preventing him from identifying it. Suddenly Sanemi appears and tackles it out of the window while yelling at Genya to run. Terrified, Genya checks the status of his siblings and tries to cover their wounds, despite their bodies already being cold. When he runs off to find a doctor, he approaches an injured Sanemi, standing over the corpse of their demon-fired mother. Dismayed at the sight, Genya runs over to cradle his mother's body in his arms and cries calling Sanemi a murderer. Genya, after remembering this past, internally apologizes to his older brother for a shock that overwhelmed him to the point of labeling Sanemi as their mother's killer, even despite the struggles that he must have had to protect him by killing her. As Sakido aims for Genya's neck, the demon slayer thinks of all of his regrets and flaws. A memory of Sanemi as a Hishira, declaring that he had no brother, saddens Genya, and he thinks about how he wasn't able to reach Hishira status to earn the right of apologizing to him. Right as Sakato scrapes Genya's neck with his staff, Tanjiro appears above them and saves him by cutting Sakato's neck. He shouts at Genya to not give up, reminding him that he was supposed to be reaching for the goal of Hashira and that he should only think about beheading Hantengu. As Tanjiro finishes speaking, he notices Aizetsu approaching him from behind. The demon uses its blood demon art, weeping spears, to attack Tanjiro, but he is shielded by Genya, who gets impaled at multiple spots on his body. Genya tells Tanjiro that he should be the one to behead Hantengu, and Tanjiro willingly accepts, dashing over to Hantengu and hitting him with his flaming sword. As Tanjiro makes contact with his neck, Hantengu lets out a piercing scream. Tanjiro puts pressure on his blade and attempts to force it through Hantengu's neck. The demon continues his high-pitched screaming, but Tanjiro refuses to waver. Suddenly, a dark figure appears behind them, and Tanjiro notices that it does not smell like any of the previous emotion demons. Opting to ignore it, he tries to behead Hantengu, but his sword loses its power from Nezuko. Genya aims at the figure behind Tanjiro, but he is unable to shoot without possibly hitting his teammate. 
The mysterious demon hits a drum and a giant dragon face tree immediately sprouts. Nezuko barely manages to jump in and save her brother, losing one leg in the process. She immediately regrows it right before they land, but suffers a massive loss of energy. As Tanjiro makes sure she is safe, the demon begins talking and names the negative emotions that individuals who are pure evil emit, specifically those who harm the weak. Infuriated, Tanjiro realizes that there are now six demons, but notices he can't sense the previous four. Genya witnesses the appearance of the sixth demon and alarmingly recounts how it used to be the anger demon Sakedo. However, after Tanjiro struck Hantengu's neck, Sakedo had forcefully absorbed his three counterparts and transformed into the childlike demon in front of them. The demon hits another drum and wraps Hantengu within his tree trunks, shielding him. Tanjiro tries to stop him, but he and Genya are both held back by the pure strength of the sixth demon's aura, a result of Hantengu's power growing as the situation worsens. The demon labels them as evil, and when Tanjiro demands an explanation as to why, he replies that the label is reserved to those who try to hurt the weak. Furious at his words, contradicting the fact that he had eaten hundreds of innocent humans, Tanjiro loudly vows to cut him down. Still trapped in Gyoko's water prison pot, Tokito thinks to himself that he has enough air for one more attack, proceeding to use mist breathing first form low cloud distant haze. But his attempt is unsuccessful, and without any more air in his lungs, he accepts his fate, thanking Kigaya Yubashiki for his support and wishes him luck finding someone to replace his Ashira position. However, he is surprised by a vision of Tanjiro who tells him that nobody knows what the future will be like, a statement Tanjiro had never said to him. In the nearby shed, Kanamori gets slashed by Gyoko as he desperately shields Hotaru from the demon. Unaware of their presence, Hotaru fixates on restoring the blade given to him by Tanjiro and mutters about the incredible quality of its craftsmanship. Gyoko observes him, confirming that he is not the chief due to his age. The demon calls out to him, but Hotaru does not respond and continues muttering about the eccentricity of the blade, a level of concentration that astonishes Gyoko. Jealous of Hotaru's fixation for his craft, Gyoko slashes him multiple times and summons another fish demon that attacks Kozo. Hotaru continues to ignore him, and his mask falls off from the attack, revealing his face, and Kozo rushes to try and snap him out of this trance. Gyoko vows to break the swordsmith's continuous persistence. Outside, Muchiro loses his ability to breathe. Tanjiro's vision keeps appearing in front of him and expresses how Muchiro himself would decide his own fate. Muchiro dismisses his words, but Tanjiro continues and informs the Mr. Shira that someone would come to save him. Although he tries to disclose his distaste for relying on someone else, the vision of Tanjiro tells him that sometimes he has to rely on others as he cannot do everything on his own. Michiro listens to his remarks and berates himself for not working hard enough to prevent mistakes from happening, and additionally, for overestimating himself. Suddenly, a knife enters the water, and Kotetsu begs Muchiro not to die, as he futilely struggles to pierce the prison. Muchiro tries to get him to go protect the chief, rather than worry about him, but Kotetsu persistently keeps trying. One of Gyoko's minions appear behind the child and slashes at him. As he runs, the demon uses its claw to stab Kotetsu. Seeing this attack, Muchiro deems the boy is dead. However, Kotetsu stays standing and returns back to the water, blowing air into it and transferring a breath from him to Muchiro. As Muchiro inhales the air, he remembers Tanjiro's words about how helping others would in turn help him, and connects his words to a man, Muchiro's father. Freshly motivated, the Hashira uses mist breathing second formed eight layered mist and successfully destroys the water prison. As he escapes the prison, Tokisa realizes that Tanjiro's eyes are the same shade of red as his father's. Machiro pulls out the needles numbing his face and begins regaining more of his memories, remembering that his father was a woodcutter. Kagaya Yubashiki's soothing words enter his mind and he sorrowfully thinks about his master's disease as he crawls to Kotetsu, cutting apart the fish demon that had attacked him. Muchiro's memory progression continues as he recalls his mother's death from illness and his father's death from falling off a cliff. When he tries to speak with Kotetsu, Muchiro suddenly remembers about his older brother, Yuchiro Tokito, his twin and sole companion after their parents' death when they were 10. Thinking back to his past, Muchiro recalls Yuchiro's blunt personality after they were orphaned and how he ridiculed their father for trying to save their mother, a man who had died when aiming to help others. 
crying. Michiru unsuccessfully attempts to get Yuchiro to stop insulting their father and instead received insults from him regarding the first character in his name, Mu, which could literally be interpreted as nothingness. The twins continue to live together despite their strained relationship which Michiru had attributed to his older brother potentially despising him. After surviving on their own for a while, the siblings were visited by Kagaya's wife who had told them about their swordsman heritage. Angered by her presence, Yuchiro drove her away and intensely berated Muchiro after he had expressed his interest in becoming a swordsman, straining their relationship to the point of forfeiting any communication between them. One summer night, a demon entered the twin's home, cutting off Yuchiro's left arm and insulting the sibling's lack of worth, angering Muchiro to the point of releasing an explosive rage. The boy managed to pin the demon down and crush it, watching it disintegrate as the sun rose. Crawling back to Yuchiro, Muchiro witnessed his brother's final words, begging the gods to spare Muchiro as he was a good person that desired to help others unlike himself. As Muchiro held his brother's hand, he told him that the Mu in his name was actually meant to represent the Mu in Mugen. Finally recovering his memories, Muchiro awakens his true strength and gains mist-like markings all over his face as he powerfully grips his blade, finally receiving his Demon Slayer mark. Yuchiro apologizes to his brother for his inability to be nice to him and that he truly tried to protect him, clutching his hand as his memories are shifted back to reality. In the shed, Gyoko is infuriated to see Hotaru continuing to work on the blade despite the numerous injuries that he had inflicted on him, including the loss of one eye. On the side, Kanemori struggles to move and Gyoko goes to finish him off, but is interrupted by Muchiro's attack. Surprised at his escape from the water prison, Gyoko sees the strange markings on his face and realizes it is similar to the boy with the Hanafuda earrings that Muzan had told him about. The boy's composed face and attack speed, despite being struck with paralyzing needles earlier, bothers the demon as Muchiro rushes in to attack again. Anticipating it, Gyoko uses his blood demon art, Octopus Vars Hell. Octopus legs fill the entire shed and trap Muchiro as they destroy the building. At the last moment, Kozo gives Muchiro his mended Nichiren sword. Outside, Hotaru is knocked aside from the attack but pays no mind to it as he returns to sharpening his blade, his stubborn persistence puzzling the demon. Gyoko opts to temporarily ignore the swordsmiths and instead focus on Muchiro as he wraps him and Kozo within his attack, exclaiming that he will crush them. Despite Gyoko's claims that the octopus is too powerful to be cut, Muchiro cleanly slices through it and releases him and Kozo. Muchiro thanks the swordsmith, though Kozo denies, stating that he simply followed the instructions from his previous swordsmith. Muchiro thinks back to a conversation with the aforementioned swordsmith, Tetsuedo, and when he had expressed deep concern for his client after learning how hard he had worked and how difficult it was for him to cope with his memory loss, eternally apologizing to him for causing worry. Muchiro tells Tetsuedo that he is alright and proceeds to use Miss Breathing Fifth Form, Sea of Clouds, and Haze to cut apart the rest of the octopus's tentacles. Yoku watches it and praises him for his speed, but retorts that the swordsman will not be able to catch up to his pace. However, Muchiro refutes his warning and suggests that the demon senses have become sluggish. Then, a confused Gyoko witnesses his neck get cut from the Hashira's previous attack. Angered, Gyoko tells him not to underestimate his strength. Muchiro said that his rival's looks are absolutely disgusting and that he thinks he scurries around in filth, which angered Gyoko who tells Tokido to shut up. But suddenly as Gyoko speaks, Muchiro notices something about the demon's pot. He tells him that he just noticed that it wasn't symmetrical and was shoddy workmanship, which causes Gyoko to explode in anger, screaming at Machiro. He uses his blood demon art, 10,000 gliding slime fish, but the Mr. Shira dodges with complete ease. He then uses mist breathing sixth form lunar dispersing mist, which manages to cut all of the fish that Gyoko had released. However, when those said fish are killed by an Achiran sword, they spray a poison which is absorbed by their skin just before they turn to dust. Because of this, Gyoko has a quick moment to ensure Michiro's demise. However, to Gyoko's complete surprise, Michiro uses his mist breathing third form scattering mist splash which manages to make all of the poison that was falling down towards Tokito fly off. Then. With the momentum gained from his previous attack, he cuts into Gyoko's neck, but just as he begins to cut through, he realized at that moment that Gyoko had begun to appear on a nearby tree while transforming into a new form, one of which only two other people had ever seen. 
He tells Tokiso that his transparent scales are stronger than diamonds and to kneel down before his perfect beautiful form. But in a complete contrast to Kyoko's expectations, Mushiro doesn't react any differently to his new form, which fills Kyoko with rage. He dives towards Muchiro and goes to hit him with more demonic fish. However, Muchiro manages to escape and flees to a nearby tree branch. While still on the branch, Gyoko asks Muchiro what he thinks of his speed and his godlike power, which can turn anything or anyone he touches with his fists into his adorable fish. After Gyoko has finished his monologue about his perfect beauty, Muchiro antagonizes him some more, saying that even the strongest attacks are pointless if they do not hit. Mochiro thinks back to his master's words, remembering that if he digs in with both feet, he can use his full strength and that if he knows who he is, then no demon can ever run when you are bringing down a blade that knows no hesitation or confusion. He urges himself to remember the boiling anger when he saw maggots crawling all over his brother's rotted body and how he himself became infested with those said maggots, slowly being eaten alive. He thinks that even if he loses his memory, his body will remember the anger that will not leave him until his death. That is the true reason as to why he is trained so hard to the point of vomiting blood. As Kyoko rushes at Tokito, he tells him to behold his true magnificence before using his blood demon art, Killerfish Scales. Kyoko says that his scales make it unable to predict his lordifying movements and begins wondering what he should turn Muchiro into after he kills him. But Takedo uses mist breathing seventh form obscuring clouds to disorientate the enemy. He then appears and seems to vanish whenever Gyoko attempts to attack him. Gyoko is confused as he looks for the slayer only to find that the whole place has been entirely enveloped in mist. All of a sudden, Machiro then appears as he utters the words, asking the demon if he had actually thought that he was the only one who wasn't being serious before. As he says these words, the demon's head gets completely sliced in half, cutting him from the base of his neck, decapitating him in that moment. Gyoko is confused as to why everything is upside down all of a sudden as his head flies through the air and falls to the ground. As this happened, Muchiro tells him that this is the end. Goodbye, you don't ever need to be reborn. Gyoko begins screaming and becomes enraged at his complete disbelief when he realized he's been beheaded by a mere child. It is then revealed that Muchiro drastically changed the speed of his movements to disorientate the enemy and that when he wants to, he can go really slow or really fast with the highest speeds even exceeding Gyoko's. Gyoko then starts completely freaking out about how he can't lose to such a low life form. He tells Tokiso that he is with a hundred of him and that he is a chosen one. As he yells at Muchiro, he gets halfway through calling him a maggot, but before he can get it out, his head is completely sliced into bits by Tokito as he tells him to just go to hell already. Immediately after Muchiro Tokito defeated Gyoko, Kanamori was extremely concerned for his health, but Takito was convinced he was fine, even though his health was obviously deteriorating. When Koso kept persisting for Muchiro to actually realize he is hurt, he instead insisted that he was fine and asked him to check up on Kotetsu. But as he says this, Muchiro starts vomiting foam from the mouth due to the poison that had finally reached his blood circulation, and because of this, he passed out. Kozu begins panicking and calls Haganezuka to help him, but instead, Kotetsu shows up beside him and told him to put Mishiro on his side. Kozu instantly remarks that this must be the ghost of the boy Kotetsu, but Kotetsu insisted that he wasn't a ghost and goes on to prove that the wound on his arm is extremely deep and he may die if he does not stop the bleeding. Though, when it came to his stomach, the hilt that Tanjiro had entrusted to him to put back on his new katana had ended up saving him. Meanwhile, Mushiro was having a flashback of Kijuro Rengoku supporting him and doing their best. His father then appeared behind him, patting his back, comforting him and telling him that it all worked out. Yuchiro suddenly appeared, telling his younger brother that he had done well. As Mushiro wakes from his flashback, it flies over to Tanjiro, who was still fighting against the other remaining demon. Tanjiro thinks to himself that there are five dragon heads that can stretch around 20 yards. As he thinks he has figured something out, he begins to use Hinokami Kagura, clear blue, but is immediately stopped by one of the demon's scream attacks, sending him flying back and crashing into the trees. 
As he tries to stand back up, he begins vomiting and realizes his eardrums had burst, making it almost impossible to stand due to the dizziness. When another attack comes flying in, Tanjiro barely manages to escape, having his foot almost completely crushed by the shockwave. Tanjiro realizes that the demon can use the strength of the previous Kuraku demons and that the overall power of its attacks are increasing. As he barely manages to dodge another attack, he is caught completely off guard by its technique as it stretches out and attempts to chomp down on him again. Just as Tanjiro gets caught by the demon's attack, the love Hashira finally makes her arrival, apologizing for barely making it in time. Kanroji tells Tanjiro to just rest and that he had done a great job before proceeding to yell at the upper rank 4 demon to give back both Nezuko and Genya, but immediately gets told to shut up as only one person in this world can ever give him orders. The demon child uses crazed cry of thunder death, but Kanjiro easily counters using love breathing cat lover shower. It is revealed that Mitsuri's sword is very thin and flexible. The speed of her techniques past that of even Tengen Uzui. That speed is made possible not only by the flexibility of her powerful katana, but by her own flexibility and incredible range of motion. Her katana is extremely difficult to use and is liable to injure anyone else who uses it, making a weapon that only she can use. As the fight continues, Matsuri uses her love breathing second form, love pangs and love breathing sixth form cat leg winds of love consecutively. So Hatuken, the child demon, notices that she is keeping up with the speed and decides to try and smother her with a flurry of his techniques. He then uses blood demon art, countless striking trees, but Mitsuri uses her love breathing fifth form swain love wild claw to cut through the attack, reaching Zohataken's body. As Tanjiro sees this, he shouts at her that he is not Hantengu's real body, which causes Kanruji to get caught right in the firing range. Zohakuten then releases his blood demon art, Compressed Sound Waves, which Mitsuri had no other choice but to face the attack head on. As Mitsuri is left paralyzed and begins to lose consciousness, the demon realizes that she has an immense strength and decides that because she has a special constitution, he is going to eat her and says that eating her superior flesh will directly lead to gaining strength. As he ferociously bears down on her head, Matsuri's life flashes right before her eyes and she remembers her first fiancé, telling her that only a bear, boar or cow would take her as their wife, along with continuing to insult her hair colour. He says that it makes him shudder just to think about it being passed on to his children, then tells her to forget about him and the fact that their marriage interview had ever happened. It then explains that Mitsuri has a special muscle composition. Her arms are thin and look weak, but her muscle density is actually 8 times that of a regular human's. At 14 months old, she was able to pick up a 33 pound pickling stone. She had an almost unsustainable appetite, eating almost the same amount as 3 sumo wrestlers. The day her marriage was called off, she decided to hide all of her peculiar traits, until one day, a man appeared, saying that he wanted to marry her. As she suddenly gets snapped back into reality, Kanroji finds that Tanjiro, Nezuko and Genya had managed to save her from Zohakuten's fist. Tanjiro and Genya say that Mitsuri is their last hope, encouraging her to get back up and fight. Hantengu releases another attack, however Mitsuri manages to get up in time and cuts through his attack protecting the four of them. All the while, Mitsuri screaming at Hantengu, saying that she will not let her comrades die as the Demon Slayer core is an important place to her. As she goes into another flashback, she remembers Kagaya telling Mitsuri that she is a special person chosen by the gods and she should be proud of her strength, telling her that whoever speaks ill of her actually just fears her talent. Mitsuri sincerely thanks her father and mother, all of the demon slayers who had taken her in, all of the people she had protected, and Uguro for giving her her striped socks. She rethinks how she wondered if it was okay to be strong because she was a girl, and realizes that she herself suppressed her own strength out of fear, but she isn't like that anymore. She is driven to protect people. Back in reality, as she flies forward, she cuts through Hantengu's attack and urges herself to get stronger. Tanjiro, Genya and Nezuko start looking for Hantengu's real body while Mitsuri deals with the other. Hantengu notices the trio looking for the body and tries to release an attack their way, but it is cut down by Mitsuri before it can reach them. Mitsuri is moving faster than before and Hantengu doesn't know how. He then notices a birthmark on her chest start to grow and remarks that it looks similar to a demon pattern. 
Hantinku releases another attack, but Mitsuri easily cuts through it. Meanwhile, Genya, Tanjiro, and Nezuko are fighting a tree that is controlled by Hentenku, and his real body is hid inside it. But they cannot cut it while their arms are occupied holding onto the tree, which leaves Genya no choice but to eat the tree. It is then revealed that Genya cannot use the breath, but instead has the special ability to temporarily inherit the traits of the demon if he eats their flesh. The top part of the tree falls to the ground after Genya eats the lower part of the plant, cutting through the trunk of the tree. Tanjiro then attempts to cut the tree up, but is blocked by the branches which act like whips. As this happens, Nezuko sets the tree and Tanjiro's sword on fire with her blood, and Tanjiro uses Dance of the Fire God, Flame Waltz, to cut the tree in half to reach the hollow inside where Hantenku's real body is. But unfortunately, he already made his escape. As Tanjiro screams at Hantengu, saying that he will make the demon pay for every sin he has committed, Hantengu remembers someone saying that everything he does in his life is his responsibility. But he says that he hasn't done anything wrong in his entire life. In that moment, Genya screams at him, calling him a moron, throwing an entire tree towards the miniature Hantengu. Nezuko and Tanjiro duck as Genya angrily rips trees from the roots and throws them at Hantengu. Despite ripping out numerous trees, each one fails to accurately hit Hantengu. Nezuko then emerges and attempts to quickly swipe at Hantengu, but he evades her and quickly speeds off. Thinking of what to do, Tanjiro recalls a conversation he had with Zenitsu regarding total concentration. He circulates air throughout the fibers in his muscles and the blood in his veins, and through this small conversation, Tanjiro is able to quickly blast towards Hantengu in an instant. As Tanjiro catches Hantengu, he swings his flaming blade down and makes contact with the miniature demon. He begins willing himself with all of his might to push through, but all of a sudden, the tiny Hantengu transforms into a grotesque, oversized demon, screaming at Tanjiro, asking him whether or not he felt sorry for him. Hantengu grabs a hold of Tanjiro's face and begins to attempt to crush his head. But just before he is able to do so, Genya makes it in time and plies the fingers of the demon away from Tanjiro's head. While he does this, Nezuko flies over top and instantaneously lights the transformed demon on fire. But this also affects Genya because he had eaten some of Hantengu's flesh. As he backs away from the burning pile of bodies, they slip off the side of the cliff and smash onto the ground below. Hantengu begins to worry, as his counterpart currently fighting Kanroji is using too much strength, not leaving him with enough to escape. He thinks to himself that he must replenish himself with human flesh, and notes that there are three swordsmiths nearby. He concludes that he will first power up by eating those three humans and then make his escape. As Tanjiro struggles behind, he goes to use total concentration to kick himself towards Hantengu, but all of a sudden, a katana flies through the air and landed right in front of Tanjiro, giving him the perfect opportunity to finally defeat the demon. As he wonders who threw the sword, he can see an intensely injured Muchiro screaming at him to use the blade. Tanjiro grips the blade and thanks everyone before using Hinokami Kagura Dancing Flash to completely decapitate the demon, finally ending their struggle. As the first light of dawn singles daybreak, Tanjiro realizes this and tries to tell Nezuko to go and hide in the shade. But this only hits dull ears, causing Nezuko to run his way in worry. He yells at Nezuko to go hide in the shade, but then notices Nezuko is pointing at Hentengu's decapitated body, which is still moving and attacking the villagers. Tanjiro looks at the decapitated head and reads resentment written on the tongue of the body, where there should be the word fear, meaning that the body Tanjiro decapitated was not the real one. Before Tanjiro can take any action to find the real body, the rays of light from the rising sun reach Nezuko, which causes her to begin to burn up. Tanjiro shields her with his body and tells her to shrink smaller, but this is all for naught, as she is still getting burned, and all the others are too far away to help him. He realizes that Hantengu's body will get to the villagers before he can put Nezuko in the box and save them, leaving him with an almost impossible decision. But before he can even make it, Nezuko kicks him in the direction of the villagers and smiles as she sacrifices herself for the sake of the villagers. Tanjiro cries as he decides that he needs to find the real body running in the direction of the fake body. He starts by sniffing out the real body, finding that it's in the headless body's heart. As the headless Hantengu catches the villagers, Tanjiro lands directly in front of him and tells Hantengu that now it's time to pay for his sins. Because of these words, memories from Hantengu's previous life flash before his eyes, revealing 
who the Demon Slayer truly was. Just before Tanjiro slices through the headless demon into Hantengu's real body hid inside his heart, finally cutting his head off this time. Tanjiro instantly collapses on the ground in sadness and exhaustion as he realizes that he has won the fight, but in the same moment he has lost his sister. But as Tanjiro weeps, the villagers shake him and point in the direction behind him. To the complete surprise of everyone, standing in the sun, healed and uninjured, is Nezuko, looking more stunning than ever. Tanjiro stares in utter disbelief as his sister greets him under the warmth of the sun for the first time in years. Skipping away from Nezuko, we go over to Tamiyo's where she is writing a letter meant for Tanjiro. In the letter, she thanks him for giving her the blood of the 12 Kazuki moons and Nezuko. She tells him that the components of Nezuko's blood changed in a very short span of time and explains that she thinks the reason Nezuko hasn't been able to regain her consciousness is because she has been prioritizing something else. She says that she thinks Nezuko will soon be able to conquer the sun. It then jumps back to Nezuko and Tanjiro. Tanjiro shakes Nezuko and cries tears of happiness as he asks Nezuko if she has become human again, but her only response is a misarray of happy words. Tanjiro realizes that even though she is standing in the sun, she still has fangs and the eyes of a demon. Tanjiro is in disbelief that she is fine and hugs Nezuko while he cries with joy. Nezuko pats his head and smiles as Genya watches the display and smiles too. Tanjiro soon passes out due to exhaustion and in the distance, Mitsuri screams as she loses her strength just as the body of Hantengu she was fighting disintegrates to dust. In another place, a maid and a child's mother walk in on Muzan disguised as a child, cackling in glee before cutting the head off the child's mother. The maid stares at Muzan in horror as he talks about how there is no more need for the blue spider lily when all he needs to do now is find Nezuko and devour her. Then he can finally conquer the sun. We then go into another flashback where we find out why Muzan wanted this blue spider lily so much. There was once a generous doctor that had turned Muzan into a demon to try and save him. Muzan had been angered that he would not live longer than 20 due to his worsening sickness, even though he had suffered so much just to only live a little bit longer. Because of this, he killed the doctor out of rage, but after killing him, he realized that the medicine the doctor had given him had made him stronger. He had obtained a strong body, but could no longer walk in the sun. Angered by this, he tried to make the medicine, but he didn't have the blue spider lily that had been used to make it. He searched and searched and searched for the blue spider lily flower, but he never found anything. The only person who knew how to make it was the doctor who he had killed. Muzan had wanted the perfect immortal body, and now that Nezuko had conquered the sun, all of the battles will be centered around her, and they will be ever the more dangerous than before. Back in the main group, Machiro thanks Tanjiro for helping him get something important back, just before Kanroji crashes into all of them, hugging the entire group, exclaiming that they had finally won. Well, that there officially brings us to the very end for the one and only Swordsmith Village arc of Demon Slayer. If you guys have enjoyed the video and want to see more stuff just like this, like more explained videos for different anime series, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video as it really helps out with the algorithm and pushes my stuff to a bunch of new amazing people, which honestly is just absolutely amazing and I can't thank you all for like how far I've come throughout this year. If you guys want to support me more, then be sure to go over and check out my Patreon and uh, thank Thank you to all of the people who have already like gone over and done that so far i really can't thank you guys enough for actually checking that out and going over there and hitting that up but anyway enough of all that kind of jargon if you guys have any suggestions for up and coming videos obviously be sure to go down to the comment section and let me know what you kind of want me to go over in the future perhaps but yeah anyway enough of that i hope you have all enjoyed the video but for now it's been your professional degenerate diavolo and i will see you all in a bit goodbye